Citrus growers in Florida report some damage from the unusually cold weather in the state today, but they say it's nothing like the killer freezes of 83 and 85, from which many growers still have not recovered. This year, growers harvested what they could before temperatures plunged, then they did what they could to protect the rest. Smudge pots and kerosene heaters are burning in groves to keep the trees from freezing, and some growers have flooded their groves to raise the ground temperatures. Fruit growers in California have the government's permission to test bacteria developed to protect strawberries from frost, but they haven't been able to get started on the program yet because of opposition from people. More from CNN's Greg LaFave. Will a frost-inhibiting bacteria invented in a test tube be the salvation of frost-plagued farmers, or will it be a runaway killer uncontrollable by man or nature? And what effects would it have on humans? Hundreds of residents and growers in Monterey County, California, packed a special meeting to hear from the critics of a proposed test of the microbe and from the microbe's inventors, Advanced Genetic Sciences. Their purpose appears to be stopping genetic engineering. We're the first to have passed the approval process, which makes us their first target. Glenn Church is concerned. He grows Christmas trees near the area of the proposed test. No, I just don't know if we're, we're really ready for this. We've gone all the years of, of human history without having to introduce an organism like this. Why does it have to be this year? The company wants to spray the new bacteria on 2,400 strawberries at an undisclosed farm. The Environmental Protection Agency approved the test last year after hearing from an independent panel of scientists who agreed the time was right for open-air testing. From all the evidence that's been gathered and all that we asked for that was, was developed by AGS through careful testing in the greenhouse and in the laboratory, the risk to the environment is extremely low. But the Washington-based Foundation on Economic Trends is challenging the test. They say the bacteria may cause insects which die out in colder times to thrive year-round, and that the frost-inhibiting bacteria could also inhibit rainfall. We cannot know from the tests that have been done whether or not this, this experiment is dangerous. Rogers said he would sue in federal court to stop the testing. The bacteria does occur in nature as a very rare mutant, said one scientist, if we'd taken the one in nature and grown it, there wouldn't be all this fuss. But simply because we made it in a lab, they're making us jump through all these legal hoops. Greg LaFave, CNN, Salinas, California. We are up to 16 minutes past the hour, and Nick Gregory will not wait a minute longer. <laughs> Here he is now, Nick. That's right, because my time will be cut even shorter. So we're going to be looking at temperatures again to be found across parts of the East Coast today. Uh, Bob and Marianne to be found again into the teens. And 20s for highs this afternoon, at least it's sunny, but it still is cold. We've got a lot of strong winds blowing in across the Great Lakes area in through the Northeast. Wind chill factors still in the 20 below zero degree range in many spots. Uh, we're going to look at some video from Pittsburgh to show you some of the snow that occurred uh, in the area and also some of the strong wind chills. Look at these people trying to get through all of this rough weather conditions that uh, are still in the area. Right now it's six degrees in Pittsburgh and the wind chill factor is about 25 below zero. And a lot of this uh, scene will be repeated right on through today until those winds begin to subside by later on this afternoon. And they will subside by this afternoon as the system starts moving away, at least the big low pressure area that is now uh, moving up and towards Newfoundland. It will continue to advance up in that direction. And then we look for some drier weather. We still have a little bit of uh, snow shower activity as this next system is developing out here in parts of the Plain States. It's light snow shower activity and it really won't accumulate too much, but nonetheless, it, again, it'll still be in this portion of the country and we still have some even flurries to be found out of this weak little system as it comes across Kentucky, Tennessee, and parts of northern Alabama. Deep south is dry, lots of sun going all the way back in through Texas and into the southwest, but again, very cold even down in through Florida. We've been keeping you posted on the shuttle weather for the launch, which again, now they're in the T minus nine minute and holding pattern. Everything still looks good that they'll be able to get off within the next, uh, I guess, uh, probably the next half hour. So we'll be keeping you posted on it. And uh, right now the launch site is reporting 37 degrees with lots of sunshine, sunshine. So they are up above freezing. It's dry through the Southwest. Beautiful here again today in the 60s and 70s and some clouds in the Northwest. Let's look at the radar summary and you can see some of the snow up in this part of the nation. The rain back to California. And then it's windy again in Wyoming. Winds have been gusting over 70 miles an hour between Casper and Laramie this morning. Snow into Minnesota, light snow, and then some coming off New England. Later today, our weather map showing us dry weather through the southeast, but still those leftover clouds in northern New England with some flurries or snow showers around, and the same kind of deal across parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. Dry through the deep south, 
And then again, we look for some rain here to arrive across much of coastal California into Oregon with just a little bit of snow in the higher elevations. Travelers advisories in New York and Pennsylvania and also around the New York City area and back to Kentucky and in the northern part of South Dakota and up in northern Maine due to some icy roads. Highs today, bitter cold again across the upper part of the Great Lakes in towards the northeast. Single numbers and teens there. 20s, though, along the mid-Atlantic coast, 30s and 40s into the southeast. But uh, we'll look at what's developing back in here. A little warm-up with 50s and 60s and 70s, and eventually we'll see some of that warmer weather moving back into the southeast, so the cold spell won't be around for too much longer. Thank goodness. 30s and 40s in the northern Rockies to the northwest. 60s and 70s in the southwest. Latest satellite view showing us the Hawaiian Islands in the picture, and you can see a nice day there, just a few afternoon clouds, and we'll close in on the Caribbean and show you same kind of a deal. Here's the forecast. For the folks in Hawaii, 82 today in Honolulu, 79 in Hilo, 84 today in St. Croix, St. John will be about the same, and Tigua at 85 today. Sunny, clear and five above in Fairbanks, 28 with more clouds than sun in Anchorage, and 33 partly cloudy in Juneau. That is our latest on the weather, more in just about 30 minutes, and I hope to see you then. Lynn? The day of fun and frolic ended in tragedy yesterday for two Massachusetts boys. 13-year-old Thomas Riley and 10-year-old Joseph Camo were playing hooky beneath a boardwalk when a tidal wave swept them into the ocean. A man jumped into the water, grabbed Riley, but lost hold of Camo. I had him by the back of the coat, and I was holding him up. But when I held him up, I'd go under. So I'm trying to hold him up, and I'm trying to hold my breath as long as I can. Riley was taken to a Boston hospital where he remains in critical condition. The search continued for Camo. The 10-year-old was found dead 10 hours later. It is 20 minutes now past the hour. Small surprise, the number 4610 turned out to be popular with people playing the lottery in Illinois. That was the Super Bowl score Sunday when the Chicago Bears beat the New England Patriots. But so many Bears fans bet the number 4610, the lottery had to double its liability limitation from $5 million to 10. That means instead of cutting off all bets on that combination at the $5 million mark, which is the usual procedure, lottery officials doubled their insurance limit to $10 million just to accommodate Bears fans. Certainly were a lot of Bears fans celebrating yesterday and Sunday, and perhaps even today. Michael Cowan's here with uh, some football news for us. Yeah, the uh, Bears will bask in the limelight for a while over their Super Bowl win, and some uh, former NFL greats will uh, be honored. The NFL Hall of Fame has five more. I'll be back in a minute to show you who they are. Closing in on 24 past the hour, the National Football League's Hall of Fame has grown by five. Leading the list of new inductees is Green Bay Packer great Paul Horning. He's joined by pro football's king of scramble, Fran Tarkington, who set a multitude of records while donning the purple and gold of the Minnesota Vikings. Also on the list, former Detroit Lion running back Doak Williams, Kenny Houston of the Houston Oilers and Washington Redskins fame, and Willie Lanier, who helped lead the Kansas City Chiefs to a Super Bowl win way back in 1970. The new enshrinees bring the Hall of Fame total to 133. They'll be formally inducted into the Hall at Canton, Ohio next August. Now, if football fans in Chicago had their way, They'd put Coach Mike Ditka in the Hall of Fame immediately. Some fans in the Windy City are sporting buttons that say Ditka for mayor, and why not? He's the hero who finally brought a championship home. More on Mr. Ditka and his accomplishments from our Jim Huber. It was, as it always is, the morning after, the gospel according to the winning coach. What set this press conference apart from most of them after Super Bowls is that Mike Ditka had something to say. I'm going to cherish this for a few weeks, and uh, I probably won't regret it until I three-putt the first green, and then it'll burn me up again, I tell you. He jokes about the legendary short fuse. It has grown remarkably longer with the passage of time and the winning of games. He might have blown three or four years ago if somebody had asked him about repeating next season. Instead... I'm not worried about that right now. Let's savor this for a while, okay? Bob, let's savor this. Let's not get negative, partner. Yeah. Well, I know, but you're worried about what's coming. Let's savor the present. Let's worry about it. No, the past we can't control. The future we have a chance to control. Let's, let's live in the present now. He talked of the quarterback, Jim McMahon, who got the Bears there. He really doesn't regard his body, body as anything important in a football game. There's very few people who can play the game at quarterback the way he does. He plays the game hard. I mean, uh, the hit he took from Lippitt early in the game when he got turned upside down, the quarterback sneak he made, he got flipped upside down. Uh, running the option play, uh, he could have pitched it back to Walter just as easy as not, and he ran it in, and he ran through a linebacker to get it in. Uh, there's a lot of courage there. So this Bears club is judged to be a great one. But just how great? 
You don't judge a team on one game or a playoff series or one year. You know, I think uh, when, when people analyze what, what is great in the NFL, they'll look back at the Packer teams under Coach Lombardi. They'll look at, they'll look at the great Steeler teams under Coach Noel. And I, I think that that's the mark of a champion, to be able to do it over a period of time. Yes, Mike, but repeating is the question still. How do you go about coaching something that hasn't been achieved in a decade or so? You work very hard to get to the top of the mountain. And, and once you get there and you look down, you, I, I think the thing you got to say to yourself, was the price you paid worth the reward you got? And if you say it is, then you can get back. Jim Huber, CNN Sports. That's football. Let's talk basketball for a second, uh, college basketball to be exact. Last night, the Hoyas of Georgetown took the show on the road to Providence, Rhode Island for a Big East feast on Friars. This one was all Georgetown. Red hot night for this guy, David Wingate. Seven for seven from the field, 20 points in the book. That led everybody. The Hoyas took a lead in the first two minutes and never gave it up. Watch the nice fake and a jump shot off the glass by Wingate. 58-39, Georgetown at that point. They post the win, 69-54. And finally, the basketball program at the University of Minnesota will continue as planned, despite the fact that three members of the U of M team have been charged with sexual assault stemming from an incident in Madison, Wisconsin last Friday. The three were formally charged yesterday. Coach Jim Dutcher resigned on Saturday, saying the program was in need of new leadership. Assistant coach Jimmy Williams has been named to lead the Golden Gophers for the remainder of this season. That'll do it for now. Day Watch continues. Here are Bob and Marianne. And still ahead on Day Watch, the long-awaited launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. We will have live coverage in the next half hour if it goes up. It looks like it just might, so stay with us. Also ahead this morning, we'll introduce you to a couple who exchanged vows underwater. Half past the hour on this Tuesday morning, Day Watch. Bill Hartley is keeping track of the people in this country who buy and sell everything from stocks to companies, and he's at the financial desk in New York. Bob, the market's having a good old-fashioned rally this morning. It started, the Dow started up, and it has continued up all day long. Right now, it is knocking at double digits. The Dow Industrial Average up 9.4 points to just a touch over 1,547. Volume, it's going to be a strong day. 56 million shares have traded, and that's about 6 million ahead of this time yesterday. That rally is extending to the broader market. Advances are about 2 to 1 ahead of declining issues, and that margin is widening. American Stock Exchange has turned around. It had been down. Now it's starting to go up, although uh, not by very much right now, only 9 one hundredths of a share. Trading still kind of slow. Just under 3 million shares have traded, but advancing issues are ahead of decliners. Over-the-counter market has a nice gain of about one and a third on its index. Volume very strong, 25 million shares, and uh, advancing issues about double decliners on the over-the-counter market. On the New York Commodity Exchange, gold for February delivery is going down. It's now off $1.40 an ounce to just under $353 an ounce. Silver on the March contract has lost two cents. It stands at $6.20 an ounce. B.F. Goodrich and Uniroyal have announced, as expected, they are combining their tire businesses to form a new company. It's going to be called Uniroyal Goodrich Tire Company. The venture will be equally owned with anticipated sales of about $2 billion a year. And let's say the move makes some good business sense. They note that the new company will be able to spend more on research and development while saving on some overhead costs. What was billed as the largest leverage buyout ever, $6 billion worth, is not yet a done deal. Beatrice Company is today saying it's still evaluating its alternatives. This coming after Colbert Kravis Roberts reduced the amount of cash it would offer for the Chicago-based food and consumer products company. It knocked it down by $3 in cash and raised it $3 in stock. Well, Beatrice isn't saying what alternatives it is considering, only that it would take up the subject of the modified offer at its February 2nd director's meeting. We'll have another full report in just one hour from the CNN Business News Desk in New York. Jordan's King Hussein today rejected several conditions imposed by the Palestine Liberation Organization before it would recognize Israel's right to exist. PLO leader Yasser Arafat demanded that both the United States and Israel accept Palestinian self-determination after a Jordanian-Palestinian state is established on the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Now, Arafat's conditions and Hussein's rejection of those conditions has left officials scrambling to salvage the tentative Middle East peace plan worked out earlier this week. 
The South African Bishop Desmond Tutu is back in Johannesburg now, again calling on the government to enact reforms and do so before the end of March. Tutu's call for worldwide economic sanctions against Pretoria unless it changes its policies on apartheid. Tutu was in the United States for three weeks on a fundraising tour. Whether any new reforms may be forthcoming from that Pretoria regime could be seen as soon as tomorrow. That is when the president of South Africa, Peter Botha, has planned a major speech, his first one since meeting with the Reagan administration's point man on that region.